do IT better. Welcome to our podcast designed for digital product builders, product owners, startup founders, and everyone who's into product building. You'll meet our colleagues from Polcode's product design and development teams. We'll be sharing our experiences gained during managing complex IT projects for global clients in SaaS businesses, fintech, education, e-commerce, and many more. Since Polcode's foundation in 2006, we've completed over 1,000 projects. By putting the best quality partner approach and trustworthiness on top of our services, we are now ready to share our tips and stories we've gained. Since all good things come in threes, let us briefly walk you through the major discussion points which we will cover in the third episode of Do IT Better? We are here with the aim of understanding how to transform the proposed vision and strategy into a pragmatic action plan. To get there, we will. We'll take a closer look at powerful tool, the Business Canvas model, at which potential we hinted uh, in the last episode. And we will examine various types of cost and how they impact on the business if mismanaged. Also, we will try to analyze the opportunities that arise from implementing optimal cost balancing, efficient pricing management, and effective monetization strategies. And finally, we will enter into the realm of risk management to give tips on how to navigate this area with necessary skill. Hello, my name is Miłosz Lichetki. I'm a manager in Polcode, leading our PMO that works on our customers' products development. I'm experienced in many business fields, working previously also as PO and developer. I'm especially passionate about agile methodologies and AI. In the last episode, we talked extensively on the importance of vision and strategy. So, Miłosz, once you already have a strategy in place, how would you devise a product, or to put it in different words, how to discover what it is meant to be? First, we had to create the uh, strategy, because this is what you need to do to define what your product will be about. Now you need to focus on the product, and to do it, one of the most popular tools, because I believe we will talk a little bit more about tools side today, is the business canvas model. There are different versions of that model. I have mentioned a little bit about it in the last episode. And so let's try to go through it to gather our ideas, yet not validate it. So we will return to this often, and so you need to accept it uh, I mean, the, the, the validation, the changes uh, that you will have in this uh, process of collecting information. And you will have to do it constantly throughout whole existence of your both business and, uh, and product. So we'll return to this often and you need to accept it. It will be evolution in some way. Maybe you don't need to often even like it, but sometimes it's needed and, you know, you need to go sometimes backwards or against some trends that were defined before. Market is changing. It's like a very complex world in which we are living and there is a lot of happening. So so you need to just uh, consider that uh, it may change often. And embracing the change, so what I'm saying about, is just uh, what we call agile way of, of management, uh, just to remind. So how we are doing the iterations, because I'm talking about the iterations, so like doing this repeatedly, it's again applying the three Vs that, uh, that I have mentioned in the previous episode. And actually, this is something that we are going to repeat, repeat in almost every episode, I believe. 
And when we are talking about the product, later we will discuss a little bit more about this, I believe. Maybe not even in this episode, but rather uh, when we will be talking and touching a uh, topic of the MVPs. It's good to decide about the KPIs or some other metrics that you will uh, use and uh, you will need to use them complexly to calculate success in your business. So just to find these success factors uh, that will determine if your business is, uh, is, is successful. So I'm talking about this just to remind you that it's important to, to work in the similar manner also with the business canvas model. There are different types of the business uh, canvas model you will find in the literature that they are a little bit different, but they usually are designed in very similar way. It's kind of table in which you have different cells, different size uh, cells, and um, those cells are usually saying about few factors. Usually, one of the first things uh, you have to write there in is... Uh, information, basic information about your customer. So we have talked about this in the first episode, mostly, that you need to have done some segmentation. You need to also find some values uh, for this customer. So you need to search for, for, for some data uh, that will tell you a little bit about your customer, what they like, what they don't like, don't like what uh, they want to do with your product. And, um, of course, here you can use, again, different tools. One of them are NPS, one of the most probably um, often used tools. A very simple one in which you have to ask your customers to validate your business if they would promote this business for you. You can uh, read voice of your customers using different tools from the internet, for example, or direct feedback that they uh, give you and analyze it in different ways also. You can do direct interviews also. At the beginning, when you don't have you know, big budget, you can just ask people around or some random guys in the internet, like on the Reddit or on a, another place, it's also a huge thing to gather interest. People are usually very happy to help other people. So you, you can get different views. And it's important because in that way, you will understand a little bit more at the beginning who your customer is. And of course, then again, with three views, you will be validating this, changing your opinion, changing your mind. And you will write this down again in the business canvas model that could be some kind of like very short one page constitution for your product. In business cases, you can also search for inspiration about your customers a little bit. So a lot of companies share their business cases. How what was their story? You can find inspiration in this. You can investigate something that was similar in some ways, maybe in another totally in, in another business field, but they had something common with your idea maybe this uh, would be inspiration also so first thing basically what uh, you need to do is to decide who your customer is and try to some factors around you in anything you will find potentially similar to your case of course prioritize uh, those that are the most similar that are more inspiring uh, for you and write it down in a very very short way few points is maximum what you have to put there it cannot be stressed enough how crucial it is to properly identify your target audience at the very beginning by conducting market research analyzing data and tailoring your business to meet their needs you can create a unique value proposition that really resonates if you'd like to learn more about that, check out our first episode. I think it is a well-grounded assumption that no single company operates in a void, but in a market which obviously is competitive. So failure can result from this competitive landscape, right? So I think, let me paraphrase maybe or 
add to the question. That would mean that one needs to follow the proverbial saying about keeping their friends close and enemies closer. Isn't that correct? Yes, at least you need to know who they are and understand what they are doing in the market. And thank you for mentioning it, because it's the usually main uh, second part of the business canvas model, that is competitors. Maybe the competitors not always uh, be enem your em enemies, as you said, that you need to keep them closer. Maybe sometimes you can change your enemies into, into friends, but you need to also be aware that uh, your market friends might be your enemies another day. And uh, remember, always you need to coexist in the market with everyone that is in the same market, especially in your niche. So remember that there are different kinds of markets and um, we usually in the economy define them and divide them into few kinds. And so uh, you have different behaviors with your competitors in the market, depending on which kind of market it is. So uh, here I'm trying to say that we have four main types of the market structures. First is the something that it's happening, but is the idealistic situation that is happening in that way. I'm trying to say about the perfect competition. It's a situation in which everyone in the market is equal. There is no any single company that can use advantage of being bigger than the others, than being uh, in the better country or better region of the world, you know, having larger company uh, so they have uh, more people uh, to think about some some changes that they can go through and so, and so, and so on. So the perfect competition is the situation that is happening in a market that is very, very, like full of the competitors, simply. As many of them there is as more perfect the competition is. That's, uh, that's simply uh, the rule. And in this market, you have to, of course, uh, see what your competitors are doing, but rather observe trying to figure out if they are not going in the new directions that might be also interesting for you, if they are not going to enlarge too much. If they will enlarge, maybe they will change the market and it will be not perfect competition anymore. In perfect competition, customers also are choosing freely. And this market can change into some kind of monopolistic competition. So this is the situation which is a little bit more realistic scenario. It's happening more often, even though we like to think that currently markets are like very free in the world especially in the, in, the, in the Western countries, I believe. But most of the markets are somehow monopolistic. There are usually bigger companies. They can dominate a little bit in the market. They have some better position because they have better opportunities to grow before. They had better investors. They are coming from the countries that are richer. And it's a little bit harder to work in the, uh, uh, in such markets with uh, another competitors. You have to be aware of what these uh, monopolists are doing. These are not perfect monopolists, obviously, I'm, uh, I'm saying. So they are not having the full influence in the market, but they are just, you know, bigger than, than the others. So if we have this kind of uh, companies, you need to be aware of them. If we have few companies that are having like 90% of the market, we are saying about the oligopoly. And this is a situation that is harder environment for smaller business to enlarge because the other companies will simply not want to allow other businesses to grow and become other competitors. In many countries, it's illegal. There are some institutions that are fighting with oligopoly. Uh, that's why they are often hidden somehow. Maybe there is a bigger structure of companies in the market that are somehow 
trying to find equal uh, positions uh, to the problems that are in the market. And they are not doing this like very openly, but you can see that they are like working in a very similar way or they have the same interests and they can also somehow manipulate on what people are choosing, what needs they want to uh, respond to. They can also share the market sometimes uh, in some some factors, for example, geographically or one size is taking richer customers, another one is uh, taking a little bit more economic customers and so on and so on. So one of the best uh, examples of the oligopoly usually are the cell phone operators markets in which uh, you have usually in each country only a few companies that are doing this. And with oligopoly, you have also very high uh, limitations. I mean, the other companies uh, have high interest costs to these markets because of the technical things that are very expensive, like with the cell phone markets. But sometimes it's because those companies just didn't want another companies to get to the market and they are fighting with uh, increasing the entry costs uh, using different tools. It's sometimes happening. And the last one, the last situation is the monopoly, so the perfect monopoly. So it's a situation in which you have one or a few com- companies that are just ruling the market without uh, any other competitors to be able to get into this market. And this is usually one. Few of them is possible if they have some share of the market that is in common equal uh, 100%. So I'm saying about this different market structures because you need to also understand that you need to define what's the interest cost to the market and if it's possible for you to get there. If it's not too high, it will be probably very hard to fight against Facebook, for example, in the IT market. Maybe you can find some niche in which you can first get your chance and lurch a little bit to get money to be able to fight against giants. You cannot fight with giants being very, very small. Usually it will not work. Usually, because there are, of course, some... Uh, what we call unicorns in the market. Reminding of David and Goliath, I guess. If anyone is familiar with that story in the Bible, I guess that would be the perfect illustration here. Exactly. Thanks for for, for saying this. So there is also possible one other thing in the market that may happen. That's the partnership between companies. You can find maybe a company that will be on partner. Maybe they have some kind of service that will it will be complementary to your service. So I mean by that that maybe you have a company that is selling apples when you are selling carrots. So altogether you can sell nice salad, for example, or you can do some kind of set menu or however you call it and sell it together in some way. Or maybe you can promote each other. For example, in your business, you can say, yeah, thank you for buying my carrot. Next door, there is a shop with the nice apples. Go there. Obviously, this is not a real market situation. Usually, you will have your own apples and carrots. But I guess you know what I mean uh, here. And it's good to find your partners. It's good to have friends in the market. Of course, observe them. It's risky sometimes because sometimes with partners uh, you're sharing some secrets and not everyone uh, always is um, is honest. So so just just be careful what you're sharing. Define your risks with every single action that you are doing uh, in a business. You need to define your risks, especially in the strategy field. And uh, well, what happens? If you have partners and you have also oligopoly in the market, uh, you can find together against the big ones also. So how do we call it? We call it cartel. So it's a situation in which we have uh, many companies that are maybe enemies in the other uh, business fields, but they want to fight against some oligopoly in the market and they know that they cannot do it uh, just simply alone. And if they connect by 
for example, joint ver- ventures, uh, they can together create a cartel. And one of the best examples nowadays is the cartel that Microsoft created together with other market giants. And they are trying to find against Google Maps to create a map system that will be able to somehow fight with with the almost monopoly that Google Maps have because almost everyone on their phones, they really simply have Google Maps. And it's not a healthy situation if we have in the market uh, just one product for the situation for to, to, to uh, solve problems, even though users like it, because users may like it. may happen some hard business decisions to be done in the Google Maps, for example, to cut something, financing something, for example, and then we have nothing. So this is the very tough situation for the market. I hope it's uh, understandable what I'm trying to say by that. So just look around in the market, and especially try to find your area of expertise again the well-saturated markets so those that are closer to the perfect competitions or those that have a lot of lot of space taken in the market so so the, the market is just simply saturated here i am again i'm uh, saying about the blue and red ocean strategy that i have mentioned in the previous market don't be afraid of your competitors. That's the last, I guess, thing I want to mention here. And it's also worthy to, to write it down in your business canvas. So I'm trying to say that maybe sometimes you have a perfect competitor that is doing exactly the same that you are doing. And you can still coexist in the market. And we have a perfect situation to illustrate that. That is uh, Pepsi and Coca-Cola. They are doing exactly the same product. Maybe it tastes a little bit. It's different, but it's still exactly the same product. It's the carbonated water with uh, some super extra sweet adding. It's black and it's like something that you use in very typical situation. Maybe not you want to hydrate yourself, but you rather want to taste something sweet, nice, if you like it, it of course. But we think that they are one of the best examples of the competitors in the world. And look, we have oligopoly here, because there there are two main players in the world, almost. There are some local companies that are fighting with them, only but usually they have to be cheaper, usually they have to put a lot of money in the marketing and so on. And and they can coexist, and they are doing exactly the same. They have created even this market probably that was not existing in a, uh, before. So how it has happened that we think that those companies are enemies, and actually they are maybe somehow not, because they commonly also need to play to enlarge this market of these sweet beverages. So we have nowadays the situation in which a lot of people is trying to be more healthy, more sporty, they maybe don't want to use it. So they had to play together in some way. But they need still to somehow sharpen the difference between themselves. And how they are doing is just the power of marketing. Nothing, completely nothing else. Even the differences in the taste between Pepsi and Coca-Cola, it's calculated between those co- uh, companies. They know how much different they need to be and how much similar they, ne- they need to be to play together in the market, but also stay with their own uh, revenues. So even the taste is controlled here. And uh, by that, I'm trying to say how much you need to focus on the on your comp- competitors, how in the perfect word you need to understand what your competitors are doing and what you want to do with that fact because it doesn't mean that you need to fight always sometimes you need to play together also that's mostly uh, all what you need to know at the beginning at least 
but the competitors, I guess. I am pretty sure that the example you gave will spark comments. If you feel like it, let us know which team you are. Is it Team Pepsi or Team Coca-Cola? Or maybe you're on board with somebody else who fights the oligopoly that me was just mentioned. Knowing your competitors is a critical part. Understanding what they offer can help you identify areas of opportunity to gain competitive advantage. This will also help differentiate your business and develop your strategy. But knowing your competition is not enough, and this is where a game theory comes into play. You need to be aware of how your decisions impact them and the other way around as well. So, Miłosz, I'm certain that achieving success definitely requires a combination of various resources that definitely go beyond just a copious budget. So, would you care to tell us more about what resources are needed? You need to understand, of course, your resources. Uh, And here you can find different things that you think are important for you to have success in the market, but also different things that you think might give you a simply advantage. So usually those resources that we are writing down in the business canvas model are money, of course, because you need to have some money to invest. Or maybe you can find a investor. So maybe your contacts to those investors who will give you money are your asset, so also your resource in some way. You have for sure people, and it's something that we don't like to say because it's like non human way to say that the people are resource. But for this only reason, in economy, we need to think about people like they are kind of resource, very special one that needs to be treated in a very sensitive way, if that's the good wording here. But You know what I mean. You have people, their skills, their abilities, their experience. These are your resources. So in common, we can say it's people. We have knowledge. So again, people, but your own knowledge, probably as a business owner or someone who will set up this startup or someone who is ruling the existing business, Your knowledge is crucial here because you will make decisions and your decisions are having high impact on what you're doing. So it's a specific kind of knowledge. But here you can also write the, for example, resources that you would like to find the knowledge in. So you have some books to read and it's also some kind of resource for you that you still want to enlarge in some way. You have time. Usually you have some limited time to market that you would like to reach when you are uh, launching uh, a new product. So you have idea, but you need to be quick. Other people are thinking in the same time. And if they are thinking, they can be faster if they will find the same. And you know, I, I just heard a few days ago in another podcast actually, but it's like very, very, very nice saying and I just wanted to underline it. There is a lot of lot of ideas that are happening in the world nowadays. In the same time, people are constantly thinking about something. But those things are usually unattended. So if they are unattended, no one is doing anything else just finding the idea. You need to work it. And your idea is also another kind of resource then uh, here. And probably later in the operational phase of your business, it will be one of the most important ones is your stock inventory. It's also a resource. It's actually equal many, but I'm underlying here it as another category because it's very important that when we will talk about this cost management. Okay. So to get back a little bit to the business canvas model, let's assume you have it all. You have deep pockets, the brightest minds, an abundance of time. But how do you actually make your product known to an audience? I would assume that, you know, the secret sauce is a well-targeted audience group. But how can you effectively promote the product to those people? 
Well, I'm not a marketing specialist here, so I believe we will have another episode touching that topic more closely. But for this, for Business Canvas model, for sure, again, after having your target audience defined, you need to use this to just effectively promote uh, your business. So what I mean by that is that you need to get into places in the internet, usually with the IT product, but not only, that those people are visiting, seeing where they actually are. And the best situation is if this is a common place for your target audience, different parts. So for that, nowadays, we are using targeted advertising platforms like Google Ads, Facebook Ads, LinkedIn Ads, just to reach your ideal audience. You need to expertise this. The best is if you will do it on your own, not depending on the other companies, because you will know the best where your target audience is, especially after some tries and fails. Maybe at the beginning, it's good to, to read a little bit about this. And we, I believe, uh, will have also another episode, as I said. Then you need to leverage the social media. So again, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, these are excellent channels to promote your product. You have to create engaging content. So that, that will resonate your target audience. Um, you can use paid promotions to increase uh, your reach. Do something that will ask a question to those people or do something that will create some discussion on your topic. As more discussion is the best. You need just simply, usually nowadays, to use it as a power that will create the organic growth for your business. And this is one of the most important things when I'm talking with our new potential customers here in Pull Code is a step that is very often not considered as something that is that important as it really is, especially uh, when uh, we are talking about the startups that are uh, going to fight the very competitive and saturated markets. So you need to use this organic growth because it's giving you more customers or more potential customers with each interactions and it will give you exponential growth so each customer will bring another customers with uh, with their own so use it on your advantage remember other companies know the same so it's also competitive to get people's attention about your business and it's very competitive market everyone wants to have other people's attention nowadays. You need to be very creative here and uh, very strictly get to those people who you are interested in. Do not spend too much money on mismarketing and getting audience that you don't want to get. Of course, you need to have high quality content that addresses the pain points of a target audience. It's uh, worthy to use blogs, social media channels, different ones. Uh, I just read a few, uh, few days ago about one of the Polish startups that operates as the company who creates solutions for quantum computers just to visualize the data. And uh, they, for example, promoted one of their products just simply on Reddit. And it worked because it was, was something very innovative. If it's very innovative, it will be easier. If it's something that it's maybe not that creative, not that modern, not that new to the market, in whole complexity of, of, of the, the, the solution, maybe it will be harder. So you will need to spend more on marketing. Of course, you can use also influencers. It's expensive thing. Remember about this. 
And uh, one of the last things I believe it's also the email based marketing, so newsletters. Maybe you can create some kind of content that will be sent in the emails. And in these emails, you can also promote a little bit about yourself by sharing, for example, a knowledge that will be something interesting also for your users. Look how many YouTube content creators nowadays that are creating some contents, even the educational one, is now putting some commercials inside between, you know, I'm talking about the black holes in the, in the space, and here between I have a commercial of VPN, for example. So also think about this as a creator of uh, some contents. Maybe your company is specialized in apples. So maybe you can create the newsletter about apples, some hidden secrets of the apples. And between just put some button, for example, here you can find more about this button, buy it. Hmm? Uh, about this apple, sorry, buy it. So what I'm trying to say is that marketing will give you customers. So you need to focus on the marketing. Oh, there's one more thing, very important, I've forgotten, is user experience. It's another thing that you also need to consider as marketing. So how your service is working, how it looks, how the people are working on it, it's category of marketing also. In order to create a sustainable and profitable business, it is worth remembering to carefully consider the amount of time, money, and other resources that you are willing to invest into your venture. This will also be helpful when defining the ways to monetize and promote your product. So, Miłosz, that's definitely quite a lot of aspects to define and consider. I assume I would be sort of maybe walking on thin ice here, but let me try. Will having done all you just talked about guarantee profit or not? You have to have luck also, <laughs> for sure. But if it's done well, what you did before, you are much closer to getting profitable business. You need to think about one more very, very important thing. Actually, two, sorry, two left. One of them is monetization. And this is the way how you are going to get money and revenue on your product. So by that, you need to consider a strategy that will give you money. I believe maybe there will be an episode that we will talk a little bit more about the monetization strategies. But first, your monetization strategy will need to come directly from your business strategy. So it needs to be something that is inside of your business strategy and you just cannot skip that part. There are different uh, type of strategies. Um, you can sell or get money by licensing, by subscription business model. You can have some in-app purchases. You can have uh, advertising in, in the app or in the newsletters or whatever. You can have uh, the model that is called pay as you go. So your users will pay for the usage. You can have the freemium model. So uh, your users will have something for free, something that is premium content, but usually is the content that will give the full functionality of your product and this thing will be paid. Here, well, it's a vast topic for another episode, definitely, but if you're thinking about the premium model, you need to calculate it very well because usually 15-20% of your users will have to pay for all the users that you will have. So think about it deeply. You can have the product-based uh, model, so you just sell your product, some product, maybe not all products. You can use the lead generation. So, for example, you have a service run something that you are selling inside of this. You can use affiliate marketing uh, for, for this um, and, and the links and that will give you money if someone will order at your partner. You can also ask for the sponsorship. 
The sponsorship model is something very often used for the startups. So also think about this. Uh, it might be for some period of time, or you can just share, you know, for example, your shares with uh, another company that will sponsor. So you put the your knowledge and know-how uh, and uh, idea and design, and they put money, and uh, together you do uh, create some kind of joint venture. It's very often used. It's also possible to have money from banks, but remember you need to have some revenue finally, so you will need to pay them back. You can get also finally, you can get some subsidies from government or or some other institutions uh, sometimes also. Monetization, so the way you are going to get money from, from your business needs to be something that will be constant, will give you money in similar a month every month or every week, however you calculated it. Is as more stable it is, the best is uh, it's uh, for your business. It's a final step of your product maturity. So what I'm trying to say by that is that first you need to model your business, create your strategy, define if it's something that your customers will like or not. Probably you will have many phases. And after those all fails will come revenue. It will not come at the beginning. Remember about this. It's investment. And at the beginning, it's also good to define when you need and when you expect to get the revenue from your business. If those two dates are similar, then it's possible that it will all work. If you expect and it's calculated that you will get the revenue in three years, but you have money only to cover one year of development and you cannot do it on your own, it might be hard. You need to think how to get the revenue after eight months if you have money for, for, for a year maximum because you need to have some overlapping period to limit the risks. It's good to have money usually for a longer period of time than one year if you are investing. So think you can combine those strategies also. Remember also that good revenue will come with good quality value and cheap in development products, uh, especially when we are talking uh, about IT development. So by that, I mean it needs to be scalable again. Something what I said uh, in the previous episode. And once again, remember to manage the development of your company using three Vs. Use MVP at the beginning to not lose too much money to test and validate your uh, product-related ideas. And there will be an episode about MVPs, so you will hear much more about this from Maria. Can I conclude that all you mentioned is my direct profit then? Um, fortunately, no. Here we come to the last thing that you really, really need to consider. And as you will see with gathering experience in the business, it's the most important factor. That's we, uh, why we left it at the beginning, uh, at the end. You need to understand your cost. What we are talking about cost. Cost is everything that uh, you need to spend money on and you cannot do on your own. It might be also time that you are not going to get money on something different if you have another source of the revenue, of course. And we have two main categories about costs. First is fixed costs. So it might be some servers in IT, maybe some licensing, maybe purchasing of, um, of some products that you need to, for your business. So something that you pay once or pay the same amount every month. Then we have variable costs that are usually people. People are costs as the resource, usually. And here you have to consider, as I said, also yourself as a person that will not get revenue from different sources. But these are also offices, maybe. Maybe sometimes they might be a fixed cost depending on, on your situation and development and so on. These are operations, uh, so costs 
if you are talking about the business that is not related to one product but more products maybe you have to have some customer service for example or you have to do something with your product just simply logistically like sense for example uh, packages uh, uh, if we're talking about the e-commerce these are your operations and you have to calculate them strictly it's your cost one of the most important and the last category of the uh, cost will be research so investment future investment uh, that you are going to do it's worth it to spend in a good times at least in the wor worst times usually is one of the categories that is first cut but of course depends on, on the on the business field there are some business fields that require high research investment constantly for example because it's some new modern technology uh, market and I said it's the last cost, but there is one more thing that is very important about costs, and it's marketing, as I said. It's different category for me, personally, because marketing is something that it's never too less. So it's always worth it to spend money on marketing as much as possible. And how to get money for marketing? You can ask yourself if we have to understand our cost and we need to limit our cost because if we will limit our cost we can get a better price for our customers or we have to monetize it in a more convenient way for our customers so for example play less commercials in youtube <laughs> joking but you know what i mean i guess so how to get lower cost and well, you need to balance, of course, the, the, the price and define yourself in some position in the market. So, so you need to balance the price also. You need to understand your costs. Try to limit them as much as possible. We are calling this optimization. That's what our, uh, the biggest uh, companies are specialized in. That's one of the best reasons why big companies are more effective in a cost way because they spend less on the processes that are usually uh, costing more in the less developed companies. You have, of course, advantage because you can have uh, people that are more involved in smaller business, for example. So you can combine it and calculate and think about this What's your advantage here in the cost. But remember one thing, one saying that is very, very important. The cost winner is a market winner. So if you are having lower costs, you will win the market because you will have more money for marketing. Just simply. Can we explore the potential outcomes of disregarding the organization's values during the strategy development process? Thank you for asking JJ about this because it's uh, it's very, very important topic also. Let me tell it quickly. You need to adjust, just simply, always. So you need to have something that will guide you in those harder times when you need to adjust quicker, when the environment is more dangerous. And you need to also something that will guide you when the market is a little bit more relaxed, when you can maybe lose something on bad investment, but still to have direction to to prepare yourself for the harder times. So market, of course, works from the harder to easier times and from the up to downs and so on. And usually in the ups, you need to prepare for the downs to survive on your survive mode. And how to do it? You can find many companies in the market that did it. One of the closest examples is Netflix, who just adjusted and from the company that was renting uh, VHS is moved to the company that is uh, you know streaming videos and it worked it many times didn't work and when it doesn't work usually it's by disregarding the uh, organization's values uh, during the strategy development process i guess example in the market is Kodak so the company uh, that was initially successful in its traditional film-based photography business. And then they struggled 
to adapt the rise of the digital photography at the early 2000s. So Kodak wasted time uh, promoting the use of film cameras instead of emulating its uh, competitors. Of course, someone may say, well, emulating other competitors is risky, as, as you said. Yes, but you need to observe what they do. And if everyone goes in such direction, maybe you need to also consider doing the same in some way, especially that it's a version to zero of your market. So Kodak heavily invested in digital imaging technology and launched new digital cameras and other digital imaging products. However, they were just simply too late to the market. So what I said before also, remember that your competitors probably are thinking about similar things and you need to be first because if you will be lost, you may lose, just simply. Why it happened? Because they ignored the feedback from the media and the market. And when they understood it was too late and they ultimately uh, f- filled for bankruptcy in 2020. I remember as a kid, there was a brand of Kodak, I don't know, every second street because there was photo laboratories like everywhere almost. And then later they just disappeared like after unsuccessful transformation. Transformation is something that will happen constantly with your business. So you need to apply your trivies. You need to do it deeply. You need to find how often you want to do reviews and do those reviews often and review everything like it's a new business, uh, sometimes even often. So uh, coming back to your question, JJ, what will happen? You just may unfortunately bankrupt it's uh, it's a business and business is a thing in which you can get revenues but you can also get into bankruptcy after misinvestment after wrong business decisions after having no strategy as a general thing and the main reason you should. The most essential takeaway in the broad context of companies' existence is balancing costs and profits to secure longevity and growth. Regular financial health checks bearing in mind long-term sustainability over short-term gains and staying vigilant to market changes is a proven approach. Remember that having a profit and loss balance sheet can help you, but should not be the main focus of a company, especially in the early stages of development. On top of that, do not forget that managing risks is also an essential part of the whole process. Miłos, I guess we are coming to an end. Thank you very much for imposing your wisdom on all of us and walking us through the complexities of the product discovery process and strategizing. So not to leave anyone empty-handed, would you please summarize the main takeaways from this episode? Yes, of course. Remember that cost comprehension and balancing would help you to find an optimal monetization strategy, as well as understanding of your clients and customers, of course. You need to understand your competitors and the market situation So you could assume a strong position of a savvy player in a market game. Know and plan your resources as they are your strengths and will help you to get an advantage in the market, just simply. Register your risks and control them carefully, the same as strategy. They are part of the strategy. Let be a master of the risks not to be mastered by them. Business doesn't like uncontrolled situation. That's why we create a business strategy. So to leave you with that optimistic thought, let me thank you again. Miłos, it was a pleasure. Thank you, JJ. It was a big pleasure to be in those three episodes. I would like guys to wish you all the best in your products. And I believe now you know a little bit of the theory of the economy that will help you to create successful business. Remember, embrace the change. It's one of the most important 
in the business field. Three Vs. In our next episode, we will leave the realm of strategy and we will take a look at a more pragmatic side of product development that would be user experience, so-called UX. To open up, we will talk about personas, what they are and what they are used for, as a continuation of user-related topics that we have started to discuss in the first episode. Talk to you in the next episode of Do IT Better. <laughs>